It's a good day to brew, baby. What is up, YouTube? It's your boy Millsy, back with the hometown commander. And per usual arrangement, it's time for me to brew a deck for you. Millsy Brew is my series where I do a one take deck tech of a new idea and present it to you for you to take test for your own purposes to let me know what you think down in the comments and just generally enjoy brewing together brewing is one of the favorite things that i get to do in the game of magic and so it's great to be able to flex my muscles three times a week here on the channel but anyway today's a little bit of a personal brew um for anyone that doesn't know, a week or so back, I made a list of some of the commanders that came out while I didn't actively do Millsy Brews that I thought maybe we could go back and, and do as, as we have time. And uh, for anyone that missed the community post, I put about two or three weeks ago, I said that we were going up to Millsy Brews three times a week. Two of those were going to be about the active set or the active thing going on. And one of them was always going to be the choice of a personal brew or just something random. And so last week... Um, we, we did some of the Kamigawa stuff, and I wanted to take a little break from that. But today, we're doing a background pair. I thought that would be fun. You know, we, we didn't really... It seems like the community didn't really look at backgrounds too, too much. Um, and I thought, why not try something different? So a while back, I had a Belladro stack, and I tried it out for a while. And I always felt like I was missing something. I always felt like I didn't quite have that... Um, that end game that I wanted. And I've seen a lot of people play Chatterfang, and Chatterfang's really cool, um, but I think Chatterfang has the stigma of being a CDH combo heavy commander. And I don't always want that uh, from certain commanders when I sit down at a table at a game shop, right? For example, uh, Miram is one of my favorite decks that I have, but when I sit down with the people have mixed opinions on Miram from what they've seen in the past and that kind of thing. So I thought, why not give us this black green sacrifice idea? Well, let's give it a new face. And that face I chose was Jahira, Friend of Forest, and Age of the Iron Throne. So uh, Jahira, Friend of Forest, says tokens you control have tap, add for green mana, choose a background, and our background is Age of the Iron Throne, which is commander creatures you own have whenever an artifact or creature you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield each opponent loses a life so for anyone who's not aware of what backgrounds do backgrounds are only active when you own your when you have your commander on the battlefield otherwise the effect does not go off and i think jahira is a good pair here because jahira is going to make all of our tokens tap for mana provided that they didn't come out this turn right because they can't if they have summoning sickness and then agent the other throne is going to lose going to have each of our opponent lose a life anytime an artifact or creature we control goes to the battlefield and that's going to be a lot of the time guys because we want to sacrifice our tokens for effects we want to use them for our purposes um so i think this is going to end up being a pretty cool combination now agent of the other throne is already used in chatterfang decks this card is already used in Corvold lists this is a this is a card that has, has seen a lot of play there but i thought why not have some fun and have it in our main deck so getting down to the lands i think this is kind of what you'd see from most um you know, sacrifice list. We've got Field of the Dead to try to get us those extra tokens. Treasure Vault to make us some uh, treasures once we have too much mana that we know what to do with. Frexian Tower to get that extra double black if we sacrifice a creature. Urza Saga is going to go get us things that are important. And we are playing the Herb or Cabal Coffers combo just in case we want to go find uh, some fun uh, that way. Otherwise, I think the two color mana base is always a little bit easier than three because. We can rely a little bit more on basic lands because of our ramp that we have in green. Getting up into our enchantments, we notice we have a good mix of um, enablers and uh, and payoffs here. So for our enablers, we have Delving Season and Parallel Lives, so double the amount of tokens we're making. Um, I think both of them are important here. You could probably just run Parallel Lives, but I think both of them are important because the we want to make sure we're doubling these we're not in white we don't have access to anointed procession or the new mondrak so we really need both of these to kind of really help us out as far as doubling our tokens up we have a couple token makers bash and remembrance kind of plays two roles it comes down and gives us a one one token but its second ability is what we really really want it for and that's that whenever a creature we control dies each one loses a life and we gain a life so when we sacrifice our own creature tokens for our benefit everybody loses a life and we gain a life and we want to do this a bunch of times that's kind of our one of our ways we can win the game uh, bitter bitter blossom just lose a life and make a token at the start of our turn black and market collection uh, connections allows us to pick one of three but we can do all of them if we want to create treasure and lose life 
draw a card, lose two life, or make a token, lose three life. And we can do as many of those as we want each turn uh, as soon as the trigger goes off. Cryptolith Right, allowing all of our creatures to tap for any color of the mana. This is kind of a backup for Jahira, just in case Jahira gets too expensive. Um, we can still use her ability. Evolutionary Leap is a new card I wanted to try out in here because I think it fits the strategy really well. It says, pay a green, sacrifice a creature, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a creature card, put that into your hand and put the rest in the bottom. So most of the combos in these sacrifice decks rely on having certain creatures and certain artifacts out. Well, unless we're drawing a ton of cards, which, which we can, we have ways to do that. This is going to get hard to do, but the one thing we have is an overabundance of tokens. We just need things to sacrifice them to. I like Evolutionary Leap because this is a way for us to put all of our tokens into Evolutionary Leap and get the creatures we really care about, whether it's to get creatures to make more tokens, whether it's to get creatures to enable our tokens dying or whatever, it may, whatever we may do with them. I like this card, and I think it works really well. The thing I like the most about it is... Unlike a card like Survival of the Fittest, where you have to discard a creature card to get a card, this is great because you're sacrificing a token you already have, and then you're getting a card out of your deck. Uh, Revel in Riches, one of those, one of our alternate win cons. Whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, we make a treasure, and then the name of our upkeep, if we have 10 or more treasures, we win the game. We have plenty of other ways to make treasures, so we're not just relying on our opponent's creatures dying. And then Meat Hook. Meat Hook in this deck... Uses a lot is a little bit less um, used as a board wipe and more of another copy of Bastion Remembrance, where that first ability says whenever a creature you control dies, each opponent loses a life. We want to stack that on top of a Bastion Remembrance or or the other effects we can get and uh, try to hurt our opponents that way over time. Getting into the artifacts, you're going to notice a lot of normal things here. If you've ever built a sacrifice deck, we're playing the Arcane Signet Soul Ring. And then we're playing the Phyrexian Altar. This is going to allow us to sacrifice creatures for mana. If we don't have Jahir or anything like that, we still get mana. Ashna's Altar is going to allow us to sacrifice a creature for two colors of mana. Sorry. And that, that can actually also combo enable combos, and and uh, we can go down the rabbit hole on sacrifice combos. Bolus' Citadel. Uh, some of these cards that damage our opponent also gain us life. Um, Bull Citadel is just going to let us play things off the top of our library by paying life instead of mana. That could be really important depending on what's on top of our library. Um, now, if you need it, Bootlegger Stash is going to let us tap our lands for treasures. A lot of people are going to first go, well, that seems dumb. But if we have Age of the Iron thrown out, which says whenever an artifact we control goes to the, the graveyard, our, our opponents each lose a life. Well, I want to tap all my lands for treasures because then all of my lands are going to ping my life, you know, my opponent's life for one, right? So Bootlegger Stash just seems like it's a really good combination here as far as doing that. And then we have two really fun uh, equipments that are going to help us make tokens. Scepter of Celebration. Gives a creature plus two plus oh, and then whenever it deals damage to a player, we make that many one ones. This is great because if we could get this on a big creature like Gnawbone or Avenger Zenikar, and we'll talk about those guys in a second, um, not only are we going to make one ones, but we hopefully will gain other benefits as well. And then Wand of Orcus, same thing. Whenever a cool creature attack, it and zombies you control have death touch. Now, we're not playing very many zombies, but one of Orcus makes zombies. This is whenever a creature creeper deals combat damage to a player, create that many 2-2 two -two zombies. So both of these guys are basically creating us tokens on combat damage. And we're going to have a few creatures that are going to want to get in and swing in for combat. So I like these. I think they're very helpful for what we're trying to do. All right, spell base. I'm trying more recently with these brews to take out as many of the expensive staples as I can, because I think that not everyone cares about a mana crypt and ancient tomb and things like that. But I think for this deck, our tutors become a teeny bit more important and we want to keep them in. We, If we want to win, sometimes we need to find our combo pieces or things like that. So we're playing D tutor, we're playing the vampire tutor, and then we're playing Diabal Content, which just got its rebrand in Brothers War because you sacrifice a creature to, to do it, and we're going to have plenty of tokens around. So I think it's going to be just as good as a Demonic Tutor in our deck because we should almost always have a, a, a creature around and ready to use to search. But let's talk about um, different things. As far as ramp goes, Awaken the Woods makes us tokens that are for us, so they could tap for mana. Cultivate, Farsi, Kadama's Reach, Nature's Lore, Three Visits, Rampant Growth. We're playing lots of ramp. We want to get our lands out quickly. We want to get our mana up quickly if we can. And the best part about Jahira is all of our tokens can tap for mana as well as her ability. So we kind of have two ways to ramp. We have the ramp cards and we have making tokens. Um, 
The other cards we're playing, Feed the Swarm for a little bit of removal. Pest Infestation, one of my favorite removal cards in Commander in Green, because we could dump as much as we want into X. We destroy up to X target artifactage or enchantments. So if, even if there's only three, we can still dump seven into X. And then we get twice X 1-1 one, one pest creature tokens that say when this creature dies, you gain a life. So Pest Invitation is great because we could just dump as much mana as we want into it. Tap out, tap all of our tokens for mana, make a bunch of pests, but also destroy a bunch of artifacts and enchantments. Their name, the numbers Legion seems interesting from uh, 40k. Create X tap to two black Necron. Uh, to creature tokens that you gain life equal to the number of artifacts you control. We're not playing a ton of artifacts, but I think the more mana we put into this, the more life we gain, which could help us against combat decks or anything like that. I just think it ends up being a net positive. And then, you know, Jahira, we have to tap them for mana uh, to get their uh, abilities. But the cool part is for things like Phyrexian Altar or Ashton's Altar, we do not have to tap them to get the mana out of it. So if we needed to, we could do it that way. Uh, and the Torment of Hailfire is one of our finishers here. Um, tap out all of our tokens, make a large amount of mana, put it in Tormenta Hellfire, and it's pretty hard for players to survive putting 12 or 15 into a Tormenta Hellfire unless they're willing to just nuke their entire board. So uh, great black finisher and tends to end lots of games. And Commander, uh, as far as our instance for our removal, we got Assassin's Trophy. Hitting anything, but our opponent can get a basic land. For the trouble, Beast Within can hit anything. Um... And they get a 3-3 beast. Deadly Rollick can exile any creature, and it's free as long as we control Jahira. Infernal Grasp destroys any creature, and we lose two life. And those are kind of our, our, our choices for removal. Uh, we, you know, if, if you're going into uh, Jund with, like, a Corval deck, you see the difference in removal that you can get there. Abs in, you know, in, in green, black, white, you know, you get so much better removal. We don't get as, as good of removal here, but I think it's okay because... This drain our opponent's life plan is going to do a good job at removing things for us. Crop rotation. Um, I always put crop rotation in any deck that I'm playing Cabal Coffers or Borg in. And the, and the reason that is is because when you see a crop rotation, you're probably going to see one of those two. And then you can go get the either or crop rotation. You can go get Treasure Vault. It can go get Urza Saga. It can go get all of these different lands um, that you want for different reasons. And so I love crop rotation. Now, if I'm really relying on Cabal Coffers and um, Urborg, I'd also put in Sylvan Scrying, which does the same thing, but it's for two mana and you don't have to sacrifice a land. But I think in this situation, crop rotation is perfect. Dark Ritual boost to that mana helps us get down our commanders quickly or uh, other things. Deadly Dispute and Village Rites both let us sacrifice a creature for a benefit. Dead, uh, Deadly Dispute draws us two and makes a treasure, and Village Rite just draws us two. So this is great because we can leverage those tokens we're so easily making to get an upside. Plum the Forgot Forbidden seems like an, it's an interesting card. It was a combo finisher a couple ways in standard. It says that the additional cost of the spell, you could sacrifice one or more creatures when you do copy the spell for each creature sacrifice that way. And then you draw a card and you lose a life. The cool part about... Um, Plum of Forbidden is if you use this on those pests that we have different things that can make, um, you'll go net zero on the life and just draw a card. But if we have a Bastion Remembrance out or something like that, we'll go net zero on the life uh, as well. So Plum of Forbidden has plenty of ways to go net zero on the life and just draw you as many cards as you need. Saw in half, going to destroy a creature we control and then create two cope tokens that are copies of that creature, but with half that creature's power and toughness. Um, this is great for creatures like Avenger of Zendikar and things like that, but we'll talk about that in a second. Saw in the Half is a new card from Infinity, and it does a lot of good in our deck. All right, let's get into our creatures, because the creatures is kind of a... <laughs> A who's who of sacrifice decks. Um, Academy Manufacturer, um, we have a bunch of things that can make clue food and treasure to uh, or treasure tokens mainly. So clue, um, Academy Manufacturer will make all three of them when that happens. Avenger of Zenikar comes in and gets a plant for each land we control. So the cool part about Avenger of Zenikar, it's, it's probably our, our favorite target for Saw in Half because when Avenger of Zenikar comes down, it gives us all these plants, which we could sacrifice to do other things with. And then if we Saw in Half Avenger of Zenikar, it's going to get destroyed, come back with two of them, and then we get its ability twice more, getting a bunch more plants. Avenger of Zenikar is great, and we don't have a ton of the haste enablers that would make uh, Z Z Avenger of Zenikar a, a game finisher. But I think it literally prints money for what exactly we want to do. Belladros comes down, gives us a pest on everyone's upkeep. But for 10 life, we can untap all lands we control. Um, that's going to become beneficial at some point. Um, I look at Belladros as kind of that threat of being able to do that at instant speed. Um, 
and being able to do a lot of good with it. Belladros has a lot of play lines that we can make, and it was my the reason that was the reason it was my choice in the past for Commander. Uh, but I uh, I realized where. I had to change that up. Chatterfang, again, the choice that most people pick for this deck, because every time you would create a token, instead you create those tokens plus that many 1-1 one, one squirrels, and you can sacrifice squirrels to give creatures plus X minus X, where X is the number of squirrels. Chatterfang is a great card. It helps get things out of the way. But again, I wanted to avoid some of that heavy hittedness with Chatterfang. And it fits perfectly in this deck. It's a card that we want. Creekwood, Liege, other black creatures get plus one, plus one. Other green creatures get plus one, plus one. So that's pretty great. We're already bumping up all of the small tokens that we're making. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, we make a one, one worm creature token. So there's just another creature token that we get each turn. Dockside Chef can sacrifice an artifact or creature to draw us a card. This is great because it's a little sacrifice outlet. And it can sacrifice itself if need be. Drivnod Carnage Dominus, a new card from all will be one made the list, and that's because of its first ability. If a creature dying causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. Drivnod will allow all of our, our fun uh, aristocrat effects that when they go off to trigger twice and will help us end the game even faster when it's out. And then for double Frexian Black and exile three creature cards from our graveyard, we can give it an indestructible. That's going to be a little bit harder to do um, because most of our creatures we want on the battlefield and our tokens will be what are going to be going to the graveyard. But I think Drivnod uh, enables everything we already want to do anyway, and I'm intrigued to see how well it does at doubling those triggers and making it worse. Marionette Master, one of our aristocrat payoffs, fabricate three swimmers the battlefield. You put three counters on it, or you create three servo tokens. Most of the time you want to put those counters on it because its second ability is whenever an artifact you control is put into the graveyard from the battlefield, target opponent loses life equal to Marionette's power. So if you give it those three plus and plus one counters, you're now hitting someone for four every time an artifact you control goes to the battlefield. And with how many treasures we're going to have access to and other um, artifacts we're going to be using, uh, hitting people for four every time is going to help us end the game. Michael Loth, when it comes in, we can sacrifice any number of creatures, and this comes in with twice that many plus one plus one counters on it. Uh, and then at the beginning of your upkeep, we create a one one sapperling for each counter on Michaeloth. If we have a ton around, it's great to sacrifice them into Michaeloth and then start gaining those sapperlings that we can use for our benefit. Not ears night blade. Whenever a token you control leaves the battlefield, your opponent loses a life and you gain a life. This is one of our great um Urstakarat payoffs to help damage our opponents. Nabo, whenever a creature we control deals damage to a player, we create that many treasures. So Gnawbone's a great choice for Scepter of a uh, Scepter of Celebration or uh, or Wand of Orcus, or it literally just immediately makes all of our tokens can attack now, and if they come through, we get treasures for it. Um, Gnawbone is one of the best cards on our top end for just getting us the mana we need to just go off or win the game with Revel and Riches. Pitiless Plunder, whenever another creature you control dies, we get a treasure. This is this is one of the biggest um, combo pieces with Chatterfang that uses in their deck, but this combos with a lot of things. Um, in all reality, this is just going to pay us back for sacrificing the tokens we were going to sacrifice already, and it leads us down for a better playline. Poison Tip Archer, whenever cr another creature dies, each opponent loses a life. This doesn't even say our creatures. It just says another creature dies. So if we can get rid of our opponent's creatures, if we've sacrificed our own, either way, each of our opponents are... Losing a life. Scoot Swarm. Scoot Swarm, everyone's favorite landfall creature. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you make a 1 1 green insect. But if we have six or more lands, we make another copy of Scoot Swarm. So we kind of start exponentially increasing the amount of Scoot Swarms we have and the amount of tokens we can make. Scoot Swarm is great. The longer you have it around, the more tokens we make with it and the more value that we get off of it. Tender Shoot Dryad. The end of each turn, we get a 1-1 one, one Sapperling, and then Sapperling's control plus 2 plus 2 as long as we have 10 or more permanents, or we've had 10 or more permanents at some point in the game. Because as soon as you have 10 or more permanents, you get the city's, city's blessing for the rest of the game as long as Terror Shoe Dryad's out. So as soon as we hit 10 permanents, those Sapperlings become 3-3s. Three Otherwise, there's one ones. I love these cards that give us a token every turn because we can accumulate them around the board as the turn order goes around. Tyler's Provision, or whenever land comes down, we get a food or a treasure. This helps pay off a candy manufacturer, but also just gives us more mana. And then Zilpor Cutthroat, one of our favorite aristocrat payoffs. Whenever it or another creature dies that we control, each opponent loses a life and we gain a life. So you see there's a lot of these effects that have our opponents lose a life whenever a creature we control dies. And we want to just stack them up and try to win the game that way. Four planes because I think all four of these 
have so much value in their own right. Liliana Dreadhorde, general, the aristocrats uh, commander, or the, the aristocrats planeswalker, in my opinion. Whenever you control dies, you draw a card. This pays off almost anything that we do in our deck. Plus one makes us a to uh, zombie token. Minus four makes each player sacrifice two creatures, which most of the time is going to hurt our opponents a lot. And then minus nine in the ultimate, each opponent chooses a permanent they control of each permanent type and then sacrifices the rest. This is going to nuke our opponents off the board and hopefully be that last thing we need to push through for the win. Lolf, Spider Queen, one of my favorite commanders of the last year or so. Never a creature we can drill dies. We put a we put a loyalty counter on Lolf, and that's great because then Lolf is going to hopefully stay healthy. Zero, you draw a card and lose a life. Minus three, make two black spider creature tokens with menace at reach, and the minus eight gives an emblem that says whenever an opponent is dealt combat damage by one or more creatures you control if that player lost less than eight life this turn they lose equal to the difference that just kind of helps if we swing out only one or two little one ones at a player it helps kind of make up for the difference but very seldom do you use the ultimate for love you're always going to be making those tokens with love soren the mirthless from vow Plus one, look at the top card of your library. You may reveal that card and put it into your hand. If you do, if you do, you lose life. It goes to its mana value. This is a way to kind of get some extra cards. The minus two makes a makes a token with flying and lifelink, and then minus seven deals thirteen damage to any target. And we and we gain thirteen life. That finisher is actually pretty cool. You just run the risk of taking some life along the way with that plus one. And then Rain and Seven has two different roles in any deck that it's in. The first is getting you land cards. This is reveal the top four cards of your library. Put all lands revealed this way into your hand and the rest into your graveyard. Zero, put any number of land cards from your hand onto the battlefield. Um, that zero ability is great if we're drawing a ton of cards in a turn, if we're using uh, different things to draw cards, and then we um, need a bunch of to put a bunch of lands down. Minus three gets us a tree folk with reach, where its power and toughness are equal to the number of uh lands you control and that is great because uh, that's going to get bigger and bigger as the game goes on and the cool part about that is it's it's that because it has that ability as we play more lands it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger it's not just what it was at the time we created it it's uh, always and then eight return all permanent cards from your graveyard to your hand you get an emblem with you have no maximum hand size so that's great so if we plus one ren and seven three times uh, and then we minus eight we are going to get back everything we milled that we don't have access to uh, and then i did not mention i forgot the skull clamp uh which can uh clamp our one ones to kill them and draw two cards just gonna help us with that card draw what do you guys think of jahira and age in the iron throne again this is my way of trying to make a chatterfang-esque type deck but still make it a little bit different we want to use that mana for some things as well but i think this is a cool idea for a deck i think jahir and agent of the iron throne pay off this aristocrat style pretty well and i think although they're different than a chatterfang or corvold or some of the other aristocrat sacrifice commanders that we have i think they do it in a cool way um that maybe will be a little bit more appealing to the table that you go play at but let me know what you think down in the comments drop me a like if you like this video subscribe if you want to see more commander content and i will catch you guys next time